Um, so I'll start with a small introduction uh, of our speaker today. So Samir is an assistant professor at the Physics and Astronomy Department at the University of Padova, where he works in the LOI PH in collaboration lab in collaboration with Amos Maritan and Sandro Azaelli. He did his PhD in environmental engineering at the Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne, EPFL, under the supervision of Professor Andrea Rinaldo. During his PhD, he worked with Professor El Turbe at University of Princeton University on the analysis and modeling of virtual water trade networks. His work focuses on the study of complex living systems and addresses a wide range of topics, including ecosystems, organization, ecological networks, stochastic modeling of ecosystems dynamics, eco-hydrological processes, sustainability, ecosystem services, and brain networks. So it's practically all sorts of uh, networked uh, systems, uh, which we can brand as complex systems. His approach to these topics, uh, he approaches these topics by adopting a comprehensive framework that includes data mining, theoretical modeling, both computational and analytical, and statistical uh, uh, analysis. So his talk is, gonna, is entitled Resilience of the Global Food System. And it's very good to have you with us, Samir. And as we said, it would have been even better if we had had you with us uh, on campus. So the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much for the invitation and the help uh, to, to the possibility to come uh, in presence also soon. And uh, today I'm going to, to actually make a kind of uh, overview was good for me. So to, to have, in a sense, to summarize the work that uh, I've done uh, uh, since basically my PhD on uh, on food trade and food system. Um, so let me uh, start by presenting um, uh, the lab. So the LEAF lab, the Laboratory of Nutritionary Physics in Padova uh, is a collaboration lab. And uh, we have uh, uh, three main, uh, let's say, uh, interests that are ecological, socio-ecological and uh, neuroscience uh, uh, topics that we want to tackle through this uh, complex system approach. Uh, but today I'm going to present uh, most of the work that I've done today and pre presenting today has been done in collaboration with um, Paolo Dodorico, a friend and collaborator from the University of Berkeley, and Cheng Yitu, uh, that was my first, uh, actually my first uh, PhD student ever that I ever super supervised. And uh, he, he is now assistant professor in Zhejiang uh, Shi Tech University. So uh, part of this work also have been done in uh, uh, during my PhD, as I was saying, with the collaboration with Professor Andrea Rinaldo, whom I thanks. Okay, so this is the outline. So I, first of all, I want to make a sense that of of the concept of resilience that is a uh, uh, multidimensional. Uh, 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 concept that has uh, several different aspects. So I want to make clear some of them. And then I'm going to talk about my, uh, let's say, first approach to study the resilience of the food system through both uh, virtual water and food trade networks. And I will explain how to build such network from data. And then I will uh, present a um, theoretical framework uh, of coupled human environmental system, HES, uh, that will allow us to try to study uh, more quantitatively uh, some uh, dimension of resilience. Um, and then also I will uh, focus on more recent work where I've studied uh, more focus on resource dynamics and where we will tackle the, 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 the problem of critical transition in resource dynamics and the effect of globalization in such transitions. And finally, I will... Uh, um, uh, talk about uh, our recent ongoing work, uh, it's currently in revision, uh, where we add also a dimension of behavioral dynamics uh, on top of the resource dynamics. Okay, so uh, uh, wait. in order to, to, I have to, sorry, I have to uh, share the sound, otherwise I will not uh, be able to, okay, so let me just uh, share again, sorry. So I can share the sound. Okay. So I want to start with a brief video uh, that uh, I think it's uh, quite clear in terms of the first broad 
definition of resilience. Communities across the country are increasingly vulnerable to natural disasters and long-term change to the atmosphere and the ocean. Our ability to withstand and recover is called resilience. The true test of resilience is how well we can bounce back. Resilience is societal, economic, and ecological. Understanding risk and preparing today can help protect the things we care about. Communities can mitigate flooding through natural shorelines, and we can work to understand how chemical and biological changes to our ocean impact marine life and habitat. We cannot overrule Mother Nature, but there are actions that we can take together to build resilient communities and support a healthy ocean, sustainable fisheries, and thriving communities and economies. NOAA provides businesses, resource managers, decision makers. Okay, so this is uh, uh, actually uh, uh, just a snapshot that show how why the uh, is the concept of resilience, but in general has to do with our ability to, to stand, to respond to perturbation and to be able to bounce back, to go back to the, uh, let's say, uh, healthy state of the system, okay? And uh, of course, uh, this uh, general concept can be applied in several different, uh, several different uh, uh, systems and uh, today I'm 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 starting uh, focusing on uh, on the food on the food trade system. So uh, in general, although of course in the last uh, uh, forty years we have uh, increasingly uh, be able to uh, uh, to to be able to 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 improve, uh, let's say the the. The, the the distribution of food and the, and also to to the, the the overall wealthy of the of the countries have increased nevertheless uh, quite alarmingly uh, in the last years uh, there is uh, uh, the global food uh, global report on food prices uh, is showing that we have uh, passed from uh, uh, an increase of nearly 40 million of uh, people that uh, need uh, food, so it's called the food inse insecure, um, uh, that uh, it's increase of 40 million people compared, compared to previous uh, high reach the, uh, last year, basically. So uh, this is a kind of alarming, and this is due to many different reasons, uh, of course, uh, social instability and uh, climate changes and different uh, patterns in uh, production of food. And uh, uh, on this respect, uh, I want to also make uh, um, clear that uh, we, uh, we have different, uh, sorry, we have different uh, scales in which we can study uh, resilience and uh, in particular with respect to the food. So we have, of course, uh, a national scale, a regional scale and a global scale, okay? And uh, I would say that uh, of course, uh, the different scale require different methods and different approaches in the sense that uh, uh, it's, uh, each scale may answer to different kinds of questions, okay? So today we will typically focus on the global scale. And what we want to understand is uh, if and how the structure of uh, trade among countries uh, is uh, increasing or decreasing re resilience overall. Resilience of what? Well, first of all, uh, let me note, uh, and this is the uh, full reference, that uh, we can uh, um, have three main um, dimensions when we speak about food resilience. And the first one is socioeconomic uh, resilience. Uh, that is uh, an indicator, of course, can be quantified as an indicator. Uh, for example, the income of the 20th percentile per capita food expenditure. So this gives us a quantity of how much uh, income is uh, devoted to food. Then we have a biophysical capacity that is, uh, uh, let's say, how much storage we have in our country, so unused fresh water, unused arable land resources. And so this is called the so-called yield gap, okay? And so this is, of course, the larger it is, the, the larger is the storage, so what we call this biophysical capacity. And the third one is related to production. So in the, 
basically give us the production diversity is of course a measure of resilience. If we rely only on one type of food, uh, we are much more fragile than if we have a, a very diverse production patterns and also different kinds of calories produced. Okay, so these are the three main dimensions that can be considered in food, but uh, in particular, what we will show is that uh, uh, we are interested to couple, let's say, the food patterns, the food trade and food production pattern to population dynamics, to demographic description of our countries, okay? So I will show you that this can be done is with a simple uh, uh, population dynamics equation, namely the logistic equation. So we want to see is how the effect of the food production and trade has an impact on uh, demographic uh, stability and growth. So which kind of data we can use to answer this kind of uh, question? Well, there is the Faustat, uh, database that is a very comprehensive open access uh, database through which, especially at the country level, we can have uh, data about food production, food trade, and uh, populations, okay? But also different kind of uh, uh, data indicators as emission of agriculture, emission land use, and so through this data, one can retrieve in particular for each country, the food produced in each country and the food traded by each countries. Okay. Uh, this can be represented in this on the top row. Here we have two countries, the country I and the country J, and TIJ is the export of country I to country of food of country I or to country J, while TJI is the import of country I of food of country J to country I. Now we can work with the food, but uh, interestingly, we can also work with the so-called virtual water. Virtual water is a calculation basically that tell us how much water has been uh, needed to produce a given amount of food. Okay, and this, has, this can be done through comprehensive global scale hydrologic, hydrological modeling, okay? And uh, now there are everywhere tables like this one, where they tell you look for 500 grams of wheat, you need 650 liters of waters to produce a stack of half a kilo, you need 7,000 liters of water, okay? Uh, so I will also show, so in part of my PhD, I also worked with the data, the food data tra tra translated in these virtual water quant um, units. That is, of course, of extraordinary interest because uh, we know that water most commonly is the limited uh, resource for food production and for, uh, for demographic growth. So with water is of course key in all of this. The problem to work with virtual water is that this complex global hydrological modeling um, give typically averages and there is strong uncertainty that typically cannot be evaluated. So somehow it's nice to work with the virtual water data, but it's let's say more rigorous, less, uh, less uncertain to work with food trade. So typically then at a certain point, we decided to work with food trade because we're, uh, let's say more safe in terms of, um, of data uh, variation. I don't know what happened. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay, great. Okay, so now let's go to see how we can year by year for each of the countries and for different type of commodities, build the so-called food uh, uh, trade network. And uh, this can be done by actually looking at the export and import quantity uh, of for each country of the different uh, types of food. And uh, so, uh, we can extend the picture that I showed before 
And so not only we have two countries, but we can start to consider all global, all over uh, worldwide countries and uh, build the import export of the food trades. And we will call this food trade uh, network. Okay. And so these together with the data about food production in, in each country give us a kind of complete view of the food available in each country through production and trade, okay? So typically I always uh, classify and the colors also show something like that, two colors here, red and blue. Uh, why? Well, because we can actually classify countries in overall exporter or overall importer of food. So we have countries that uh, export more than what they import and countries that import more than what they export, okay? And so we uh, uh, typically, you will see that we class we divide these two into uh, different uh, type of, of, uh, of, of nodes, okay? Now, just uh, for those who are not uh, familiar with the mathematics of network, uh, so once we build from the data set, this kind of object, we can translate this object into a table or also called matrix, where each of the letters represent a countries. And then the value of this entry represent the amount of food that from C goes to F, okay? And what is white, it means that B does not export nor import okay, food from or to the country F, okay? Of course, we can consider the volume of food. So this is a number between zero and, uh, I don't know, one billion. And this is called weighted at GCC matrix, or we just can consider if there is or there is not the interaction, the, the trade between two countries. So this is, becomes a binary matrix, solely one or zero, and this is called the adjacency matrix, okay? So from these trade food networks, we can build uh, weighted or non-weighted adjacency matrix. And these are the building block of our, uh, let's say, calculation and models. Let's just start with data analysis. So there is no model here. We just have taken the data. We have build uh, the networks and the blue represent the net exporting countries. The red can represent the net importing, uh, represent the net importing countries. And then we can have a picture of how this export, import, export balance change through time. For example, on the top, we can see uh, these uh, food trade networks in the 1986 while in 2010, we can see that the network is changed. And uh, by I, we can realize that there are much more arrows. That means that there are much more uh, uh, trade, right? And indeed, if we can look at the average number of links per node, also called the degree, that is a quantity that quantified the number of trades on average. Well, you can see that in time, it, will, it's in, it, it increases. Right, so we have a kind of, this is actually, you can see this as a really, the quantification of the globalization of the food trade, right? So we really can see that we almost doubled in uh, 25 years, the amount of links in our network. And from this network, we can actually study different properties, the distribution of the different number of connections for each node called known as the degree distribution or weighted degree distribution. But also we can study pattern uh, of interaction among nodes, such as the clustering or such as the average nearest neighbors that tell us for a given node, what is the average degree of the neighbors? Okay, I'm not going to focus. This is the full reference where we study this for the virtual water trade networks, but you can also see uh, reference where this has been done for the full trade networks. And all this we can do in time, 
okay? So this is the nice uh, uh, analysis that we can do once we translate uh, the table of the Faustat basically into network. Now I want to introduce a new concept that is the carrying capacity. So in general, you can think that there is a balance, I mean, there is indeed a balance between birth and death. And this is true at the ecosystem level, but also it's true in our complex ecosystem that is uh, the earth and the, the humans, okay? And in general, when you model the population growth, you can think that there is a carrying capacity due to environmental uh, factors and the resource availability for which, let's say that is like a kind of the maximum um, value of population that can be sustained uh, by the resources or by the environment, okay? Of course, humans have the ability to increase this carrying capacity, uh, but let's say that theoretically, at a certain point, there should be this kind of carrying capacity. And uh, as you can see uh, here, there have been many studies that have tried to quantify such kind of carrying capacity or planetary boundaries. Okay, so why I'm going to uh, introduce the logistic and uh, the carrying capacity? Because we can actually very easily use the data that I just show you, the networks, to calculate the carrying capacity uh, for each country. And in particular, the calculation is quite easy because we can think to do, to do it like having the total so let's let's focus first in, on a given country, and so this is local. So in a given countries, you can look at the food production. So you don't consider export or import, right? You just consider the local production, and then you might consider also the storage, the possible uh, biophysical redundancy of uh, food production, and then you divide it by the average amount of calories that a person needs to survive. And these tell us, on average, these are very under the envelope calculation. So you don't have to take it too seriously. But it's like to have an idea of the order of magnitudes. And you can actually compute the carrying capacity that locally it's possible for that type of land in that countries. Okay, But then you can do this taking account for the import and the export. So now I'm doing this for the virtual water. And so the carrying capacity locally plus the import of virtual water minus the export of virtual water divided by the average consumption of virtual water for per capita. These tell us the, let's say, uh, carrying capacity considering import and export, okay? So we call it virtual carrying capacity. The virtual, in the sense that it's not only relying on, re on local resources, but also on the import and export of, from other countries. And once you do that, what you can do is actually, you can compare the two. And in some cases, you can have that the local is much higher than global, than the virtual, or other, it, meaning that the country is an, is an exporter while in some cases, the virtual can be much higher than the local, meaning that the country is an importer. Okay, once we do that, then we have the demographic dynamics that, as I told you before, can be calculated through a logistic equation. So this is the population of country I, the population of country I change in time through a growth, and this growth alpha I can be also dependent on time and can be calculated from data or can you can use an average one quantity. And then you have a carrying capacity, okay? And so the question is, we know we have the data about demographic growth. And so we ask ourselves, can this simple model describe more or less, at least qualitatively, the trend of demographic growth 
for each country. And if it does so, it, it does it with the local carrying capacity or with the virtual carrying capacity, okay? So I want to repeat because this is an important point. I have a model for population growth. From population growth, I can actually model how the population change year by year. And I want to compare this with my data. And I ask if the model, the model is, can, be, can have two behavior, two different behavior. One, if I use the local carrying capacity, one, if I use the virtual carrying capacity. So I ask the model in the two cases, how is compared with the data, okay? And so this is what we found. And in very intriguingly, we found that in the red are the so-called virtual water dependent country, meaning the country that import more than what they export. And the blue line is the logistic growth using the virtual carrying capacity. So the carrying capacity that also consider the trade. And in all virtual water dependent countries, the growth follow the logistic with uh, the virtual carrying capacity. But on the other hand, the blue line, the blue, sorry, countries represent the countries that has a larger export than import. So we call it water rich countries. And in this case, the demographic follow the logistic growth with the local carrying capacity, not the virtual carrying capacity. So this is very interesting because we see that there is a kind of imbalance. The red countries grows relying on the import of the, of the other countries, but the blue countries grows without accounting for the export of the countries. So there is a water global imbalance. And you can do the same exercises, but with the food. So similarly, you can take the food production, the average calorie per person, and you can build this the K local carrying capacity, or you can do this local carrying capacity plus the import minus the export divided by the average cal uh, calorie consumption for person. And this is called the total carrying capacity. And again, you can see that, uh, for example, uh, in this case, we have that the total carrying capacity and the local carrying capacity might describe one more better than the other, let's say, the behavior of the demographic growth, okay? And so you can see, for example, that there are some inconsistency. That's why we told you that at a certain point we started to use food trade countries uh, because in general, in this case, you can see that the United States of America has a carrying capacity that is more consistent with the total carrying capacity rather than the local carrying capacity, okay? Actually, in general, you can see that in all the cases, um, this total carrying capacity, the red line, is more closer to the data. So let's say that from one point of view, uh, one can argue if the previous result, how much was let's say, uh, due also to some bias in the estimation of the total carry capacity for the virtual water. From the other side, it's quite curious that there is a systematic error for which exporter grows following the local carry capacity. Okay, and then you can do this systematically for the countries, and then you can actually divide the, the countries in all the world through different... Uh, pattern, net exporter, net importer, no effect of trade and food scarce region. And uh, where, of course, net exporters are the one in which they grow following the red carry capacity. The net importer is the other way around. The no effect of trade means that the global and the local carry capacity is the same. And uh, food scarce is when both carry capacity, like in Liberia, are underestimating the actual growth of uh, demographic of the countries, okay? All right, so now 
let's introduce some mathematics into the picture. So right now was just, I mean, yes, I also use the logistic model that is a very easy model, but I didn't do, I just use the model to make prediction of, of estimation of the population from the carry capacity. Now I want to introduce uh, how resilience that can be quantified. So up to now, we didn't perturb the system. We didn't test its ability to bounce back as uh, the beginning I, uh, I defined the resilience. So now let's see how mathematically we can define resilience. Okay. So let's take a war. Population, logistic dynamics. Here I is each country. And now let's say that we want to see if I perturb the system, if I make a perturbation, how easy or not easy these dynamics can go back to around a given state, no? And to do that, we first need to understand what is the linearization operation. So this is a, a quadratic equation. More in general, here you can have a f of x. That is a nonlinear equation. So first of all, to test the resilience, you need to choose a given point. Okay, so for example, here x equal to one. And now we want to ask if we are in, in x equal to one and we perturb the system and we now let the system evolve, it will go back to this point or will just go away from this point. If it goes back, it is resilient. If it goes away, it's not resilient. So first you need to choose a point here, one, one. Second, you need to consider just a small region of the, again this point. But when you consider just a small region, you see that the nonlinearity actually is not so important. In fact, we can approximate the function with a linear function. And this is called linearization. Why we do that? Well, because in this case, the equation is becoming a linear equation that is much easier to study, okay? So once we do the linearization, and this is our equation, there are theorem that tell you that you can actually write any of this uh, factor X as a combination of the so-called eigenvalue, eigenvalue lambda and eigenvectors V and U of the matrix J. Now, of course, you need to know a little bit of linear algebra to understand this, the, the composition, but in the simplest way you can think about, if you have a vectors in the Euclidean space, one, 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 you know that you can decompose that vector as the sum of three base vector, one, zero, 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 one, zero, and zero, zero, one. Actually, you can do the, do the same through these eigenvectors of the matrix J and the eigenvalues, okay? But beside the mathematical, details, let's try to understand what does it mean. Well, it means that if the lambda you see here is a, in an exponential point, it's a, the exponent of an exponential that, and that is multiplied by time. So if lambda is positive, while the t grows, these become larger and larger and larger. So you really go very far. So this delta, that is the difference between the, the point one one in that case, and the difference once we have perturbed the system will increase, increase, increase. So the system will become unstable if lambda is positive. While if lambda is negative, if all lambda is negative, you see the larger the time, this goes to zero. So delta X goes to zero. That means say you go back to your original point. That's why in uh, this is called asymptotic stability. That is the analysis for large time for large time, if lambda max is greater than zero, you are unstable. So you go far away once you perturb. While if lambda max is, is more than zero, you are stable. So you go, you reach equilibrium once you perturb. Okay. So we have a similar, less known 
uh, indicators about, let's say, resilience, but now is not uh, for asymptotic large time, but is for short time, just after the perturbation. And this is called the reactivity. Okay, so reactivity you see is the behavior of your system very just after you perturb the system, if you perturb it time t equal to zero. Okay, and this is the full reference if you want to know more detail, but the idea is that you perturb at time zero and you may, you may have two behavior. The first behavior is that you just, I mean, the, you see, you just go down. Uh, so the, the perturbation is attenuated in time. Or you can have something like an increase and then decrease. So for so short time, the effect of the perturbation is the maximum. So in this, this case, A2 is called reactive system, while A1 is called non-reactive system. And you can, can calculate this again from the matrix J, and the matrix J, you just have to compute the gain values of J plus J's transpose. Okay, so now for those who doesn't know, uh, I mean, transposition is in linear algebra, don't worry. But there is just a number that you can calculate from this matrix that tell you if the system is reactive or not. So taking together, we have something that tells us for large time what the system is going to do and something that tells us for small time what the system is going to do. So now the idea is that we want to apply this to the food trade countries. Okay, so uh, the idea, the simple idea beyond the model is the following. So we have a population, but the population depends on a carrying capacity and the carrying capacity can be calculated through our food trade network and food productions. And the population grows, the alpha can be again calculated from demographic data that are available. So we can, we don't do actually any fit. We just parameterize everything from the data. And then what we want to do is study the asymptotic stability and the reactivity of such dynamics equation. Okay, so this is just a slide of kind of complex mathematic, but uh, don't worry, you don't need to really follow all details. This is just a repetition of what I said about using equation. This is the dynamics. This is the logistic. I have added here a small but important detail that is there is a delay in the sense that the, 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 the let's say that the growth depend on the production of food and the, and, the, and, the, and the availability of food, not in that, I mean, on the, that you have produced a ta, some tau before, of course, so there is a delay. This alpha is the demographic growth that you can calculate from data. And because of this delay, it's more complicated than mathematics, but overall, at the end, it's what is important that from this data and from through the trade network, these are the SIJ, so the WIJ here. So from this WIJ, you can, you can calculate the phi, from the phi, you can calculate this S, that is what you need. So here, from the data of growth and from the data of full trade, you can actually parameterize this equation. And now we linearize this equation we linearize this equation and we study the game value of the linearized matrix, the J, what we call J before. And these are the result. So here in time, I'm counting the number of uh, um, again values that are larger than minus 0 0.005. So the one that are very close to the instability or are unstable. And what you can see is that uh, although not so clearly, but there is a, a quite systematic increase of number of countries that are unstable, both asymptotically that in their reactivity, okay? The trend is very similar. So again, in a different way, we found that the globalization decrease resilience, okay? The second one, again, is that we can divide the countries in different groups, similarly as the one we have done with the carrying capacity. We can divide by uh, most reactive countries, less reactive countries, country dependent, food trade country dependent. And what we found is that the food trade dependent countries are on average more reactive than the countries that just rely on their own food production. And this is quite I mean, 
understandable, right? So if I depends to import, if there is a perturbation on the system, this affect me much more than if I just rely on my local country, uh, local food productions pattern. And this is just an example of uh, three countries that actually are very much uh, food trade dependent because they import a lot of food. And you can see that indeed, uh, they are also those that are very sensitive to a specific time perturbation. Of course, this analysis is just a snapshot. You can do this year by year and you can focus on different quantities. Okay, so the first conclusion that I want to make is that there is an existence of unbalance of food or virtual water trade pattern and that demographic growth pattern in some countries at least are disconnected by resource balance globally. And the food or virtual water trade dependent countries are the most exposed to perturbation. Now let's focus on the resource and uh, here we'll go just a little bit faster. Uh, first of all, there is an important uh, effect that has been uh, observed in real situation that is called critical transition. So this is the so-called collapse of the Atlantic Cod stocks in the Grand Banks in Canada. And uh, there was a whole business of companies here that were fishing code. And this is the amount of fishing in tons. And you can see that during the 70, 80, there has been like a huge spike. And this huge spike then has been corresponded to a huge decrease. So here you see there is a huge variance. And after this, suddenly, there has been the collapse, global collapse of code. And this is so true that right now, basically still, there is no uh, cold fishing in that region of the Atlantic and uh, all companies have been, are, have been failed, right? So this is a true effect. How can we model that? Well, you can model that as the fact that you have two kinds of stable equilibria. One that is the sustainable one, but then if you pass this kind of barrier, you end up in the extinction stable point, okay? So this is what the kind of transition that we want to study from sustainable to unsustainable. But we want to do that in a system that is interconnected because the codfish are not fished just by you, you, a single actor, a single user, but are, are fished by different users. And these users also can connect, can uh, interact among all, among each other, okay? Okay, this can be, again, translated in a mathematical framework that is kind of similar. Uh, the demands follow the logistic equation. There, and this is how the code, in this case, uh, the resource in the specific, for example, in the example was the code growth. And the code grows through an ecological dynamics that is quite known to, to be a good candidate of dynamics to describe ecological system. It's called the Ali effect and with logistic growth. Of course, this is the natural growth evolution of the code, but then you have to take out and uh, take in, of course, the import and the export because, uh, I mean, you have that in each country, you may have different point, uh, different uh, places where you can fish the code, okay? So of course, uh, this, uh, her, this user, these are also connected. Maybe an even easier example is to, again, a food trade. So each country has some resources and you can grow these resources, but you can take your resources and export to another country, or you can take another uh, the resources from blue and import, okay? So again, this is the kind of similar dynamics that we have studied, but uh, uh, with this Ali effect. Okay, now let me just uh, focus a little bit uh, on the uh, 10 by 10, but it's uh, just go faster. Here is, you have the consumption of the node, the growth, these are the effects that they just told. And then here is the resource outflow and the resource inflow. Okay, so this is very similar as before. And of course, the network, Again, the connection pattern tell us uh, about the globalization of this system. Okay, now, now I just have another technical note, slide 
for those who have more interest in the technicalities, but this is just the idea that in this, um, okay, this is a kind of complex uh, dynamical system because you have S units that are interacting. And uh, this idea, this picture here of uh, one state and other is very simple in one, in one dimension, but in more dimension, it's quite complicated to study and understand this, at least analytically, but also numerically, actually. And so we used a mean field approximation approach that from this multidimensional system that you can see it may have very complex transition, you can actually write on a 1D effective equation. And so basically in this way, from the system of uh, S coupled equation, we end up with just one effective equation. Okay, so I don't have the time to go into all details, but uh, if you are interested, you can ask me later. Once we have this one effective equation, we, are, we can actually study this transition between sustainable and unsustainable. And what we found is that uh, indeed that there is one important parameters that we call the network heterogeneity. Uh, that is how much basically the in degree and the out degree are balanced. So if the distribution of the in degree is quite similar to the distribution of the out degree, we call this homogeneous network. While if the distribution of the in degree is very different from the distribution of the out degree, then we call it heterogeneous network. And this heterogeneity parameter is our control parameters, okay? Okay, and then, okay, this is uh, for those who know dynamical system, it's quite easy to read. So here you see the, why it's called control parameter. It's called control parameters because it uh, determine the state of the system. If eta is very large here, you can see that the only equilibrium is the sustainable equilibrium A. While if eta is very small, then the stable equilibrium is the so-called B. So this is the extinction. And there is a point in which these two transition occur that is called the critical point. Okay, first we can study this uh, for some kind of random matrix. Um, here, a new, there is a whole word to say about our random matrix, but let's say these are a kind of null model where you don't put any structures. You just assign a random, the links or the weights, but uh, it's very useful because it can give you insights of how the structures and the dynamics are related. And also you can have sometimes analytical result. And this is the case if we use this random Erdos-Rini graph, in this case, we can, can calculate heterogeneity. And we can see that indeed, this is a, we, we have that for large heterogeneity in this network, we have extinction. For small heterogeneity, we have a, sta a sustainable state. And now we can relate this heterogeneity parameter to the connectivity. Okay, so how much dense is this network? And you can see that for large connectivity, then the eta is small. For small connectivity, then the eta is large, okay? And so you, you, what, what does it mean? It means that for small connectivity, eta is large, but if eta is large, then you are in the depleted state, in the extinction state. And this you can see also here, for low connectivity, you are in depleted state. For large connectivity, you have, uh, actually what you have, you see you have uh, small, eta, so you are here, in this case, you are stable. And in fact, you see that for large connectivity, the probability to be stable is very high. So you see, we found this kind of transition depending on the connectivity. So for Erdos-Rini networks, the globalization is uh, helping the system, is uh, make, making the system more sustainable, okay? So less transition. But very interestingly, if we now change the network and from Erdos-Rini, we uh, look at the Barabasi-Albert scale-free networks, then we found exactly the opposite, okay? So for low connectivity, high probability to be stable. For large connectivity, low probability to be stable. This is in the high heterogeneous regime. While for the low heterogeneous regime, then we have that the network is always stable, no matter the connectivity. 
So the point, the interesting point here is that depending on the underlying topology, we have, I mean, we may have very different effect of the globalization on the system resilience, on the stability of the system with respect to this critical transition of the, of the resources. And uh, the same is true if we look at the modularity, okay? So the modularity is the tendency of networks to make groups together as in the pictures. Again, for low heterogeneity, we have that basically the modularity does not play a big role, but for high heterogeneity, then the modularity has a role and it may, the, for higher modularity, you have much more lower effective eta and so more stable, the higher the probability of sustainable state, okay? So for high modularity, you have very, the probability to be stable, uh, sustainable, it's, uh, it's close to one, okay? So now, of course, we can ask, well, and so in real network, what is this? Uh, so the, 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 the point here is that we show that the, there is no universal answer, okay? You have to really to look network by network and see in that case, the network's connectivity is helping or not or, or, or detrimental to sustainability. So we take the foot trade networks and uh, we, uh, we know already how to build it. And now we have the data from 1986 to 2013, we have the population. This time we model, we fit the model parameters alpha and K. And from this, we can actually study uh, the eta, okay? So now we have the data, we have the, our dynamics and we can study the data. And what we found, well, we found this is much clear. First of all, this is a pattern that we already seen that in time, the connectivity increases. So this is the picture of globalization. But what you see also is that for increasing time, also the eta, the heterogeneity is increasing. And in fact, you can see that there is a positive correlation between connectivity and eta. But if you remember, but in this case, for large eta here, the system is depleted. So again, and, and this is the tendency. You see, we started from here in the 1986, and we are moving towards the instability point. These are data. data. So again, in a different, using a different, let's say, pictures and different kind of framework, although some similarities, we also find that globalization is detrimental to stability in the sense that uh, favors the appearance of critical transition in the resource dynamics, okay? So this is, uh, again, the conclusion that uh, because of this uh, unbalance, so this heterogeneity, okay, in the network distribution, we have that globalization is detrimental to sustainability. And let me conclude now five minutes with, my, with the, this ongoing work. So up to now, we just uh, focused on the dynamics of resources, but, but what about users' behavior? I mean, um, one users can be more, more fair in the usage of, and we know that in the usage of resources, another users can be more, uh, I mean, have uh, like more defection and, and so uh, disrespect, let's say the, the environmental equilibrium. And so we want to add this kind of, of behavior and we do that through the theoretical component of the model. So, I mean, I think most of you know the famous uh, tragedy of the commons that in the two uh, people's uh, game is uh, the so-called prisoner dilemma. The idea is that there is one good equilibrium that will be the best for each one, that will be cooperation, cooperation, three, three. This is the payoff. But actually, uh, because this is not the dominant strategy, meaning uh, if one cooperate and the other defect, the could defect gain more, at the end, both player defect. And so the equilibrium, the final equilibrium is uh, an equilibrium that is less convenient for the two players, but this is the stable one. Okay, and we, one can generalize this two game with the end game and in continuous limit, you can end up with the replicator equation where X here tell us the fraction of cooperators typically that you have in the system and the change of between cooperation or the fraction depends on the payoff on the reward of your neighbors, okay? 
So now if we combine, I mean, just a word about the tragedy of the, uh, about what has, this tragedy of the common is something that we can, I mean, we observe, okay? So this is typically are uh, resources that are not excludable so that you cannot actually limit the access to few users and also are public, okay? And uh, this is, uh, has a two, this two combination lead to easy over exploitation, okay, of the resources. And again, the scale here is important. We have a global and a community scale. In this last part ongoing work, we are focusing on more local scale, okay? So not global, but local scale, okay? Farmers, village that have to use a resource or something like that. And uh, our work was inspired by the work from Armstrong and Armstrong that was a Nobel Prizes that was uh, claiming that if you have shared goals in communities, there is a self-organized uh, sustainable behavior without the needs of centralized control that most of the time result also in uh, corruption and so in defection, even if, it's in, if, it's in, if it is centralized. The framework, I think now you are quite familiar, is our logistic, but now we have also an equation for the fraction of people that cooperate. What does it mean cooperate or, or cheaters in this, in this respect? It means that if you are a cooperator, you fish just the right amount of fish so that they will be sustainable. While if you are cheaters, you extract, you fish more. Okay, so if the ED or EC is the extraction rate, ED is always larger than EC, okay? And T would be the sustainable extraction rate. So if you extract smaller than T or larger than T, you are cheaters or cooperators. Okay, and these are the two equations. Now we have our equation, but also with the, the behavior of cooperation. And what we did is uh, to put uh, online a uh, platform that we call Systemic Sustainability Game, where each of the player has to play this game. So there is the resource that is uh, logistic growth, and you have to decide how many fish you have to fish. If you cooperate, you fish the right amount. If you defect, you fish more. But at the end of the game, you are paid in real dollars, depending on the number of fish that you fished, okay? And we did, so this is uh, basically the framework, but we played two versions of the game. The first game, we just play pay each player, depending on the total number of fish, so the total extraction of the resources during the game. While in game two, we divide all the players in two group. And then we say, okay, we will pay only the players that belong to the group that have overall and during the whole game, the highest total payoff. So we push shared goals among players in the second game. And incredibly, we found a very different result between the two, the two games. In the first game, as expected, we retrieve the tragedy of the commons. People are greedy. They defect a lot. So this is, we have just a 20% of cooperators and the resource just go very quick to extinction. But once we introduce the shared, these shared goals, we have an enormous increase of cooperation from 20 to 80%. And we obtain that now the resources are sustainable. Okay, so just introducing shared goals, we found that indeed that there is a self-organized cooperation in the system. And so the conclusion of this uh, third working uh, uh, ongoing work is that Armstrong and hypothesis that shared goals favor the self-organization and the sustainability of resources can be confirmed quantitative, uh, quantitatively through these online experiments with, um, with, of games with environmental feedbacks. And also, I'm not showing here, I, we propose a theoretical framework that can quantitatively describe such result. So with this, I want to thank you. And these are all the reference, I think most of the reference that I showed in the talk of today. And uh, I, of course, uh, this is my uh, website. This is uh, my Twitter account that I use for work. So if you want to take, uh, be in touch, just uh, follow me or uh, just visit our website of the lab. And with this, I want, uh, of course, I'm open to questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Samir. I think, can you hear us? Can you hear us well? Okay. Yes. So I'll uh, invite uh, the audience who's with us on uh, Zoom to either raise their hands or their, uh, write their um, questions in the chat. And I'll start with the audience in the, uh, in the auditorium. Someone has questions. Yes, Rua. Uh, hi. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I just have a couple of questions about the like the middle part of the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, when you uh, were, um, uh, when you started with a model for uh, population growth, mm -hmm. just like the one for the logistic map. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, uh, based on that model, uh, you derived uh, order. Yeah, based on that model, basically you got uh, graphs for uh, the case, the one, the local and the... Uh, no, so the, you mean these parts before. here, even before, yes. Yes, before. Yes. Yes, these these two. Um, basically, um, like some graphs, um, they are, uh, they fit the data better than the other uh, graphs. Yes. But, um, um, but how would you justify the um like that difference and like for some countries it's okay like the, the there is a good fit but for others there isn't and uh, how is that related to the model of population that you chose okay so let me just first uh, um make clear one point that is uh in this part here in this part here i'm using the model okay while in this part i'm just comparing basically the carrying capacities with the demographic growth, okay? So here there is no model and there is no fit actually. So I'm taking basically K as the import of the food from the data minus the export from the food from the data. Then I'm taking the food production, K local here. And then I'm dividing everything by the average use per capita of calories. And this is really something really, really bad. I mean, this is really like a back on the envelope calculation from physicists. So you don't really expect to get the real thing, okay? And uh, this is really like a, a way to get inside of the order of magnitude, okay? And yet what is interesting is that even with this very simple and crude and average the calculation, you get something that is not completely crazy, right? So you get something that actually the total carrying capacity is, I mean, I mean, it's something close, I mean, to, 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 to the data. Sometimes is larger, sometimes is smaller, and this can be, inter I mean, this can be somehow interpreted to the fact that uh, this is a kind of null model, and you, in this case, Burundi, there is more population than the food that you actually expect right while for example in thailand there is a population that is uh, a slightly smaller than what uh, basically can be sustained but uh, i would say that this is just an interpretation the the truth is that i think that uh, this is very interesting in the sense that we with the really a back of the envelope calculation without any fitting you are getting kind of the same order of magnitudes of the of the of what you actually measure in the in the data in the demographic data okay so this is more about make sense of the numbers rather than fitting okay this is instead more a fitting uh, things okay uh, and indeed you can see that in fact here is it's much more better in a sense okay i hope i answer your question uh, okay um um so if you'd like to, for example, this is just a measure of uh, order, as you said. So for example, if you change something in the initial model that you started with, um, how would you, I, I mean, like for me, it seems that like um, uh, more than one model would give you the same order or because like um, there is not uh, like very clear uh, way to see if this is like, a good model or not, because like you're just using an order. Is, or... Yeah, but this is not a model. That's uh, I'm trying to repeat. This is not a model. This is just okay. You can say 
on, P, on average, how much do you eat? You eat uh, 1,800 calories, okay? Uh, oh, I mean, whatever it is. Then you take, okay, then I look how much food is produced. Then I just uh, take the import. <laughs> then I took out the export. And then I just divide this number by the average. So this is not a model, right? This is just a calculation, a rough estimate, a kind of Fermi calculation to understand the, how much population do you expect, okay? While, okay, so this is not a model. This is just a calculation. This is a model, okay? Uh, the model, this is a model, okay? Here you are saying that populations grow exponentially and then there is a carrying capacity, okay? And then you can fit these two parameters or one of the two parameters on the data, okay? And then doing so, you can actually find something that is good or not good to the data. Of course, you are right. Is this the only model that can fit the data? I, no, I mean, of course there is, uh, this is always like that. I mean, you, you may have different models that fit quite good the data. You have two ways, then you can do like statistical analysis to see, to decide which the model is the best one. But this is not really our aim, right? This is not the, the aim to, to make a prediction about the future population or something like that. Uh, so in this sense, uh, we are just using the very simplest model, in a sense, uh, uh, to, to describe uh, the data, okay? So uh, the problem of having different models that can fit the same data, this is always true. Of course, uh, depending on the question you're asking, you might want to make like a statistical, deep statistical analysis to make a discrimination between the, which is the model that uh, is the best one, or you just use the simplest model if it's good enough to explain or understand what you are trying to describe, basically. I think that's, that was a very fair answer. Uh, Andre, can you, uh, if you want to uh, ask your questions live, you can unmute yourself. Um, hello, hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for this presentation. And second of all, I have a question. Uh, when you said that globalization is unsustainable, um, the way I understood it is that it's unsustainable because the global food network uh, is a scale-free network. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And if so, does that mean that if at the current rate, uh, globalization is unstable, at one point where um, we would have a distribution of degrees that's almost the same across all countries where we don't have countries which are more important than other, would that mean that we would get to a stable um, stable global food network? Yes, exactly. So this is uh, the, exactly the point that you are asking it is this plot here on the bottom left, okay? So here at the time it was, to, I mean, the, what we did is like just, just make an extrapolation. If uh, the network is becoming more and more heterogeneous, you can see that the ETA is increasing, so the, the network is becoming more and more uns unsustainable. But if instead you actually started to change the network so that it become homogeneous, then actually you can see that uh, there is a slow but uh, systematic improvement in the ETA as you are becoming sustainable. So this is exactly true what you said. So. I mean, in this simple model uh, in, you know, with this assumption and so on, uh, but it's true that if you, like say, if you may build a future where you are trying to make more balanced trade, uh, then uh, this model will predict that uh, the system would be like more sustainable and that the globalization would not be detrimental anymore to the system. And, um... Given uh, given the study and at the current pace that things are going, does it seem that globalization goes towards uh, this extrapolated model or uh, the other model, or do we have no idea? No, uh, so what we see is that uh, up to now, this is what you see. That it is indeed going towards uh, worse. More, heter more heterogeneous, uh, more heterogeneous uh, network. So this is just up to 2012, so I, Actually, I never took the data. This could be like a good uh, project if you have to do one. Uh, just take uh, the data of the last uh, 
years and try to see if this trend is confirmed or if maybe there is some kind of different trend. This could be interesting. Uh, we, we did not check, actually. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Uh, we'll take a question from the audience here, and then move to Garo's question. Yeah, there is also a chat uh, question that have uh, been asked on the chat. Then yeah, I can... we'll, I'll be flipping back and forth between perfect, the audience perfect. and the. Okay, great. Hi, thank Hi. you for the talk. Um, it's very interesting. Um, I'm from archaeology, not maths, and the mathematics makes me feel physically sick. But um, what I'm interested in is, could you? Um, would it be theoretically possible to develop a model where with known, the word you use is perturbation. So for example, volcanoes exploding, known global climate change, um, you know, despotic oligarchs leap rising up and forcing everybody to grow different crops. Um, and then predicting what should have happened, should there have been a collapse. And then we can look at how communities in the past actually responded to those problems um, and then potentially learn from that. So I'm guessing the question is, can you kind of reverse engineer some of this? Yeah, so, um, well, if you, if you would have like a um, fine scale uh, enough data in which you can actually have the data of a specific perturbation and then see how uh, the rewiring of the networks uh, occurred in a way that it was uh, somehow uh, helping to restore a previous healthy state. Uh, yes, so in a sense, you could try to, to see how rewiring patterns in, in, in examples of uh, of actions that had a good effect and try to reverse an engineer to understand that. Um, but I guess that these kind of data are very, very, very different to obtain uh, because I mean, uh, um, you, we, I mean, we tried in some, in some cases, I mean, you, you, you know that um, for example, uh, there was uh, this crisis in Argentina, I think in 2001 and they suddenly ban all the export of the wheat and uh, and actually china was like a major importer from argentina and then you can ask how can i mean how how they deal with that and then you try to look and basically it's not easy but you can track a little bit of movement and what you see is that basically the united states shift uh, completely pattern of export and started to export to China. So basically you can see that finally uh, the, the ban of the export in Argentina was actually be more detrimental to countries that were not previously connected with Argentina. But because of the shift of US, of US uh, they started to, to have a bigger impact, okay? So this is quite tricky. I mean, this is after you really to have to focus on a specific question and try to see if there are some data but in, I think in some cases you can do you can do kind of reverse engineering to better understand what 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 happened. And uh, while for like uh, kind of prediction, although I don't really like really the, the word prediction because it gives the sense that you can really know what is going to be that this kind of complex model is not true. I mean, you can have an idea of how some Futures of the system may impact more or less other observable. And so you can do like simulation to better understand this. And I think that this reference here is actually trying really to simulating a cascade of effect from a production shock. And so in this case here, we can really try to, we really try to, to follow a kind of simulated perturbation through the system. And uh, and so I uh, similarly this this work here in 2016 uh, was try to see if you have food supply shocks so if you stop to make trades what happened to these dynamics of uh, of trade so again I think these two references here are kind of trying to make 
what you ask is so to simulate some kind of perturbation and try to follow this over time. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Samir, I have a question that uh, comes a bit on the mathematical end. So you had to go to uh, a logistic equation and linearize for you to get an understanding of stability. Though you had the network as a whole to explore and uh, do some topological measures on you know, the nodes with high, high betweenness, the nodes which are less central, which had, will have given you also an idea on a different, probably a different measure on this reactivity or uh, eigenvalue of the Jacobian of this logistic equation. Have you done this alternative approach uh, of looking at the topological measures of the network rather than having to fit uh, the growth model uh, and looking at Jacobian and linearize? Uh, no, uh, we actually never uh, looked at the directly on measurements of resilience of the foot rate, like for example, removing nodes or removing link directly on the interaction networks. We didn't uh, went through this that kind of approach. Uh, but do, would you think that there probably lead to the same results, like looking at between a centrality of some, because somehow some of the identities of the, uh, uh, let's say less resilient are embedded in their centrality measures, right? Um, uh, it's, uh, I mean, this is uh, maybe for a dynamics that is as simple as the logistic equation, yes. But in general, I would say that it's not actually uh, granted that the structure and the function have the same kind of uh, resilience properties. Um, there is a paper by Mario De Domenico that is showing that, I mean, for example, in simple diffusion, it's actually like that, but uh, uh, you can uh, um, actually think about dynamics that are highly nonlinear. So uh, in that case, is, uh, I mean, uh, um, also the, the linearization leads to a quite a different networks with respect to the input network to the trade interaction networks. But uh, with this simple uh, logistic equation, I would say that I expect that, yes, uh, to find quite good correlation between uh, structure and function, let's say. Yeah, I mean, and, and it can be carried out by students if they're interested. I think just yes. to look at the trade network and, you know, look sure. at uh, um, betweenness and try to yeah. map them out to the logistic equation results. Yeah, uh, yeah also have, also try to remove nodes from the absolutely. structure and see yeah. how fragile it is. Yeah. So like cascading failures. Or yes, so things like that. We, ha we have a question from the... Uh, audience on Zoom by Garo, so he's thanking you for the presentation, and he's asking if you could mention examples of the perturbation you mentioned that can disturb food systems. Are they quantified in similar ways to the resilience of the system? Oh, okay, so in general, uh, the, 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 the perturbation while you study asymptotic resilience or reactivity are completely general, so the only things that you say is that uh, you have X, that is your population, at time t, and then you just perturb x and you go x plus delta x or minus delta x. Uh, you can also do this on the model parameters. Uh, this is something that also we didn't do actually by perturbing, for example, the parameter of the of the of the model, for example, uh, the full production, and that would lead to another kind of stability called the structural stability, and it's also something that we didn't actually study. Uh, but in general, yes, uh, these two papers that I mentioned here, Hesling et al. and uh, Marchand et al., here we actually really mimic some kind of realistic kind of perturbation. And then we try to actually really follow the perturbation and quantify the, the resilience on the full system. So probably um, here, for example, the shock is on the supply. So how much uh, export and production, and uh, here is uh, sorry how much export and here the shock is about production. So because of uh, I mean like uh, spread spreading of fire, or for example now you know from the wheat problem in Ukraine, you can mimic like um, kind of um, for example it's known that the, the Arab Spring was uh, actually ignited by 
increases of price for bread that was related to a, a season of extraordinary, extraordinary uh, fire season in uh, Russia and Kazakhstan, for example. So yes, you can actually really mimic this kind of event and try to see what happened in the in the network through simulation. Thank you. We have another question from the audience. Thank you. I just have a couple of questions. The first has to do with the local carrying capacity. Um, if you can go back and explain how you quantify that, I'm not sure if I missed it. And the other has to do with identifying equilibrium states. Um, if we can, instead of looking at the eigenvalues of the matrix J, if we can look at the detailed balance equation of the containing the carrying capacity. Okay, so the carrying capacity calculation is very simple. Uh, is uh, just uh, uh, you look at the, the production of food in a given country, and then you uh, look how how much import uh, in that country, and then you look at much export. So this the I mean the food product the production plus the import minus export is the overall food that is available in that country. And then you divide by the average calories per person that is used. And so you have, a, I mean, you just have an amount of food that you can translate in calories, depending on the commodity. You divide it by the average calorie per person and this give you a number. And this number is just a back envelope calculation to uh, quantify the number of population that can be sustained uh, with that production and trade pattern, okay? Um, so in other terms, you just like, you say, okay, how much food there is, uh, you do production plus export plus import minus export. And then you say how many people can eat with that food. That's the basic idea. Okay. Um, about the, I didn't tend to get, not sure that I get, you're saying you have, uh, ba the balance equation. And what you're asking if from this balance equation? Yes, if you can use it to uh, identify equilibrium states instead of just looking at the eigenvalues. No, basically, uh, no, this, in, I mean, you need, uh, you need this balance equation to actually, to actually calculate the eigenvalues because you need to solve uh, the, the equation. Uh, so, uh, so uh, you cannot uh, use this instead of the eigenvalues. You need to solve this in order uh, to uh, to get the eigenvalues. Yes. Okay. More questions? Uh, okay. I would also. Uh, want to go back to the mean field approximation. There again, you sort of blurred out the identity of the, uh, you know, the, the country. The, I mean, you're looking at the global trade network, but again, uh, with no particularities to the peculiarities of the, the countries with no uh, yes, topological yes. measures. Again, uh, they're blurred out. Okay, can this also be carried out with more details uh, without looking at mean field loads? Since you have the network and computational resources, one can look at things uh, from the data perspective rather from an actual modeling approach. Yes, let's say that uh, the point is that if you want to, to estimate uh, the critical transition for a multidimensional system, you see that uh, there is a, um, I mean, the situation also numerically it depends on many, on many aspects. And uh, so it's not easy to quantify this in the multidimensional uh, Perspective. Uh, we have also worked with the, we have a nice science where we generalize this kind of mean um, field approximation. Let's say that in this case, we were interested to have just one equation in order to really characterize things in order to have a compact. Uh, I mean, the problem is, is that if you have the multi dimensional system, then you may have really a lot of things that matter. So basically, the idea is it was really to determine the key the key property of the network. So, okay. So basically here, what we, why, why we, we applied this mean field was to, to really try to understand what was the, the control parameters of the transition and what we 
hope we, we think we we have, we have understood uh, is that uh, the, the, for example it's not really important uh, i mean th two things we have i think we have understood that uh, the kind of uh, relation between connectivity and sustainability depends on the network structure so depending on different network you may have different relation and the second thing we have understood uh, is that uh, the heterogeneity of the network is really the key driver of uh, uh, sustainability yeah. so once you have understood this, yes, of course, if you are specific interested in a specific system and uh, you have all the details and that, then you can try to make simulations and uh, and do this in a like more uh, a refined way. But uh, through simulation would have been very difficult to get this kind of uh, synthetic uh, and uh, uh, concentrated result on, on the on the sustainability. Yeah. I guess that was fair. Um, I think if we have no more questions from the crowd yeah. on Zoom, Thanks. let me just, just double check if someone had raised their hands and I've missed it. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Maybe not, I think, and, and I guess no more questions from the audience and the auditorium. So uh, this might bring our uh, talk to an end and please help me in thanking Professor Swayze in uh, this beautiful talk and walkthrough. Thank you and very much. Hopefully we'd have him on campus uh, in uh, some uh, upcoming talks and upcoming yeah. events. Thank you very much. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye.